All right, Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Well, friends, when we look at problems on this show, frequently they circle back to one dictate, follow the money. You can think about the 2008 financial crash, the Iraq war, the politicians that sell us out, the addiction crisis, the hollowed out industrial Midwest, the war hungry military industrial complex, the lying partisan media, the climate crisis, all the way down to, let's say, Kim Kardashian scamming her fans in a crypto scheme or to a tongue of Iloa sent back into the field to risk his life after suffering a concussion, risking it all. Why? Because the coaches in NFL brass care more about the almighty dollar than about the human beings whose lives and health they've been entrusted with. Now, Normally, when we talk about these issues, I'll talk about the corrupting influence of money. I'll inveigh against the dangers of putting profits over everything else, including health, family, peace, and human life. But there is a name for the system that puts profits above any other value, and the name of that system is capitalism. Now, you might call it unchecked or unfettered capitalism. You might argue that we're just doing capitalism the wrong way. Perhaps. But at the core of all these issues, which have been allowed to fester and grow into a destabilizing, possibly world-ending mess, is capitalism. And specifically, capitalism of the type ushered in by the Reagan, Clinton, Bush, Obama, neoliberal era. Now I have just found out, I have an unlikely ally in my assessment of the situation, comedian Bill Burr. Take a listen as he responds to a message that he received from a conservative fan who was upset that Burr had favorably mentioned socialism. Um, Last week you mentioned, uh, you don't know why people demonize socialism. Um, I was really taken aback at that statement. Oh, Jesus Christ. Every country that has tried socialism has failed, and it's responsible for tens of millions of deaths. All right, so would you say capitalism is working? And is, it is not, uh, you know, when like, what is it, like 99% of the wealth is in like fucking 2% of the people's hands? All of these tent cities, you're telling me this is working? You don't think capitalism is responsible for tens of millions of deaths? Um, Anyway, Russia, Germany, China, Cuba, and most recently, Venezuela have tried or right now are socialist countries. Um, As far as I know, whatever Cuba was trying to do, we prevented them from doing with a fucking embargo or whatever the hell we did. We've been fucking with them for 60 years. So I think you're looking at like, you know, like what a lot of people do is you look at your own country through rose colored glasses the same way you look at your own sports team. Like, oh, my team doesn't cheat, but your team does. You're, You're really you're really sort of looking the other way with what capitalism has done to other countries. Um, All the sweatshop labor, all the wars we fought in over air quote freedom, where most of it is about, you know, natural resources, all of these fucking countries where we've gone in and, you know, stuck in heads of the government that are going to do what we want to do so we can fucking take advantage of them. Like, I mean, to sit there and look at capitalism, like, like it's, you know, I don't know, dude. It goes on, by the way, mocking the listener for pointing out ills of communism that have all been replicated under capitalism. Things like racist scapegoating, government surveillance, genocide, destruction of the middle class. But a really key point here that I think is worth reiterating is this idea from Burr that we look at our own country and our own systems through rose-colored glasses. We've been schooled our whole lives in the worst of what happened under authoritarian communists, primarily the Soviet Union, of course. And I am not here to stand for any authoritarians on the left or the right, nor am I interested in rewriting history with regards to the failures of full-scale government central planning. But what Burr is saying is absolutely true. We're trained to keep blinders on when it comes to seeing the ills of American society, which are in part, at least, caused by capitalism. There is in DC a new museum, it's called The Victims of Communism. And I wish I was kidding when I tell you that the park right across the street houses a sizable homeless encampment. Dozens of tents lined up, people suffering with mental health issues, addiction issues, all sorts of things who have been chewed up and spit out by our society. Many days, you can see these victims of capitalism literally sitting on the steps of the Victims of Communism Museum. I cannot think of a more perfect encapsulation of our cultural blindness to the rot caused by our own system, which we live with every single day. But since it's the water that we swim in, sometimes we just can't see it. Let's just do one super clear example here of what I mean, which is to dig into the opioid addiction crisis. Now, you probably know the outlines of the story. We've covered it a lot here. But basically, the Sackler family, owners of Purdue Pharma, start selling Oxy, pushing it as a non-addictive painkiller. That assessment, by the way, that it was non-addictive, that was based on basically nothing and given a rubber stamp by a government regulator who then went and turned around to work for Purdue Pharma. There's that almighty dollar again. Doctors who get frequent visits and goodies and trips and dinners from pharma reps, they start prescribing Oxy for kids who get sports injuries, laborers who suffer from chronic pain, and its use becomes commonplace, especially in places that were devastated by job loss thanks to capitalism. 
The Sacklers knew almost immediately after that drug was introduced in 1996 that Oxy was addictive and was being routinely abused, including being crushed and snorted, that doctors were sometimes selling prescriptions, that the drug was being stolen routinely from pharmacies and then sold on the street. But they did worse than nothing. They buried the evidence. They doubled down on that popular drug that was making them billions of dollars, pushing it rather than backing off. We all know what happened next. We ended up with the worst overdose crisis in our nation's history. Deaths from opioids skyrocketed as those who started with oxy switched to heroin and then fentanyl, leaving, a pla leaving a be behind a trail of misery, pain, and death. Now, you could say the Sacklers are evil. No argument for me there. But in another way, they're also totally unremarkable. They are creatures birthed by capitalism, a system that is designed to put money before lives. After all, they were far from the only ones who got in on this multi-billion dollar grift. Johnson & Johnson, McKinsey Consulting, Endo International, Teva, and on and on and on. All major companies that profited from their role in creating the opioid crisis. No drug cartel could possibly have done to this country what these blue chip American multinationals did. Some of these are public companies too. That means that they are actually duty bound by their responsibility to their shareholders to push dangerous pills on the population if it means getting a little bit better return on investment. Think of how utterly disgusting that is. And yet that's not a bug of our capitalist system, it's a feature. Capitalism created the jobless misery, the profitable pill to numb the pain, the cover up to keep it going for decades, and the perfect excuse, personal responsibility, to keep those suffering treated as criminals rather than humans who are worthy of care. Now, I think conservatives would tend to look at this series of events and they would focus on the individual failings, the greedy sacklers, the corrupt regulators, the drug traffickers who brought in the fentanyl, even those who allowed themselves to become addicted as the right has tended to view addiction as a moral and criminal issue rather than as a public health issue. That's why, to the extent there's a right-wing critique of corporations now, it centers on the individual ideologies held by corporate executives rather than that overall system as a whole. The woke HR exe executive, for one example. The answer, they would argue, to this whole problem comes from locking up the bad guys, bolstering those institutions that would improve the morality and values of the population, primarily the church and the family, while attacking those institutions they believe are degrading public values like elite universities. Now listen guys, I literally live in the town where I grew up in. I'm close to my parents. I believe family and community are absolutely critical to human thriving. And by the way, I do think that capitalism is also destroying those institutions of meaning, but I'll save that piece for another day. But while individuals certainly have agency in their lives and should be accountable for their actions, as a people, we are utterly powerless before the overwhelming forces that our economic system has unleashed. How are you gonna faith and family your way out of every job in your town being shipped overseas so that profit margins can go up a tick? How are you gonna bootstrap your way out of a system of surveillance capitalism that is constantly devising new ways to colonize your mind and keep you glued to your screens? How are you gonna personal responsibility your way out of endless wars to feed a profit-hungry military industrial complex that is literally content to risk nuclear war if it means a better earnings call? Problem isn't wokeness or college kids or trans teens or public school teachers, it's capitalism that wants to turn you into that generic, unthinking, profitable, sheep-like consumer. Now, liberals, of course, they've got their own version of the personal responsibility narrative, by the way. The problem is the deplorables or the Karens or the toxic masculinity. If there were more women and people of color running these corporations, then the government wouldn't be so horrible, the corporations wouldn't be so horrible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This all, of course, is a distraction from the real issues. We can do better than accepting the deaths of despair and the skyrocketing costs and the destroyed middle class and the endless wars and the murderous healthcare system that we have now. There are a lot of options on the path between the corporate-run state we live in now and some Stalin-style authoritarian central planning nightmare. In fact, persuading Americans that our only options are Stalin or the Kochs is a pretty key way that the radical and deadly status quo is preserved for all those who profit from it. Bill Burr has it absolutely right. Time to take the blinders off on the victims of capitalism who are all around us. Hmm. And Sagar, um, Went a little deep there. That sparked that a lot good. of thoughts for me. For but you. I was curious what your reaction was to, to his comments there. Uh, Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it.
That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.